Had anybody even told Jennifer that perinatal hospice was available, that aborting her child wasn't her only choice when she got the unfavorable prenatal diagnosis? I don't know, but I'm guessing not. This is Christina with the Sisyphean Journal, and today is February 7th. Now, welcome to the Sisyphean Journal, where we discuss women's abortion deaths and how they could be prevented. Of course, I would prefer to prevent them by the abortion not happening in the first place. And if the woman persists or if the people around her push her into an unwanted abortion, I want to figure out how do we stand between her and the kind of quackery that abortion rights activists, both before and after legalization, seem to be totally okay with. Now, Jennifer was a 29-year-old kindergarten teacher, and she and her husband, TJ, were eagerly anticipating the birth of their little girl. They named her Madison Lee. But there was an unfavorable prenatal diagnosis. Now, something that is very little known is that there's a service called perinatal hospice that can be offered to women who are given a bad prenatal diagnosis. And what perinatal hospice does is it connects the woman to other women who've faced the same situation, who faced the same diagnosis. So first of all, she's getting somebody who really does understand her situation because I can't. I totally can't. And the doctor can't unless it's a woman who had the same diagnosis for her baby. And One of the nice things about perinatal hospice is the woman's able to develop a birth plan. She's able to think about what the prognosis is for the baby. They make the women make decisions about do they want to go uh, with a vaginal delivery or a C-section? Do they want to induce labor at a particular time? They can make all those decisions based on the mother's health, the baby's prognosis, and just decide what's best for the whole family. And then that maximizes the time the family gets to spend with the baby. Unfortunately, doctors and other medical professionals tend to push hard for abortion. And the reason is because doctors do not go into obstetrics because they want to walk through weeks and weeks and weeks of a tragic situation. They want to be there for the birth. They want to be there for the joy. They want to be there for the celebration. So when this horrible diagnosis comes down, they go into fight or flight mode. They want to get out of this situation. They do not want to see this pregnancy through because it's emotionally draining for them. They push for an abortion. The pregnancy's over. And that doctor never has to give it another thought for the rest of his life. But it's not that way for the woman and her family. No matter what the outcome is, an abortion or the birth and the baby dies, this is something that she's going to be carrying with her the rest of her life. I've never heard of a woman who regretted going with perinatal hospice, but there have been a lot of cases of women who regretted going with the doctor's recommendation for an abortion. And the other thing is that going for abortion maximizes the tragedy because there are a lot of cases where it turns out there's nothing wrong with the baby. I know of two fatal abortions performed for fetal indications where the woman did not want the abortion. She was pushed into it and then She died and there had been nothing wrong with the baby in the first place. And the baby is perfectly healthy. Well, fat load of good it did if you go for an abortion and the baby's healthy but dead. You know, whereas if you go with perinatal hospice, there's a chance that, wow, what a surprise. The doctors were completely wrong or the prognosis was wrong. The baby's condition isn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. But you shut off the possibility of getting any positive um, out of this situation. 
no chance to hug the baby and cuddle the baby and um, let the family be with the baby. You just go for maximum tragedy right off the bat. And I get really upset at how doctors push women into this. And I don't know if anybody offered Jennifer perinatal hospice or not. But when she was 33 weeks pregnant, she went to Germantown Reproductive Health Services, which was a National Abortion Federation member, where Dr. Leroy Carhart was going to do her abortion. Now, he had already been the doctor involved in the abortion death of Kristen Gilbert. Uh, she was an intellectually disabled woman who was pregnant as the result of what would have been statutory rape because she simply didn't have the capacity to consent. Um, and her family was staying with her at the hotel. That That's how these late abortions are done. Um, the woman goes in on day one, they do all the paperwork, they put an injection into the baby's heart to kill it, and they insert these laminaria, these little seaweed sticks, to expand the mother's cervix. And the further along in the pregnancy it, she is, the more often they have to change these out. So it can be a three or four day procedure with swapping out these laminaria while the woman is carrying that dead baby inside her body. Um, the idea that this is going to be emotionally easier for the woman carrying that dead baby in her body for three or four days after she signed the child's death warrant because doctors told her that was the best thing. I don't know. That doesn't sound like that's any easier for the mother to me. But at any rate, um, Kristen had collapsed in the hotel room and instead of calling an ambulance and taking her to the hospital, they put her on a luggage rack, loaded her in the minivan, and took her to the clinic. Carhartt was the doctor on duty that day. This was at George Tiller's clinic. George Tiller, oh, the hero of the abortion rights movement, because he was willing to do abortions. He had no gestational limit. What he had was Kristen Newhouse, who would rubber stamp any abortion as being necessary for the mother's mental health, period. Um, and that's how he skirted the law. So at any rate, Carhartt was the one on duty that day. They did call an ambulance. And when the ambulance crew got there, they thought that Carhartt was a bystander. They didn't know he was the doctor because he was performing CPR so ineptly. That's the doctor that Jennifer trusted. And the pro-lifers who gathered outside the clinic when Carhartt's performing abortions reported seeing Jennifer arrive for her clinic appointments on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, appearing pale and weak. Jennifer spent over nine hours at the facility on Wednesday. After she was discharged, Carhartt and his wife left the state to go to another abortion facility, probably went back to Nebraska or to Kansas. Well, I think he only had his clinic in Nebraska. I don't think he was, I don't think Tiller's clinic was open anymore. Now, according to Operation Rescue's anonymous source, and Operation Rescue's pretty good at checking their sources, Jennifer started suffering from chest pain early on Thursday morning. She was unsuccessful in her attempts to reach Carhartt. In fact, she got through to the answering machine for Carhartt's wife's equestrian supply business. So fat load of good that does you when you're suffering abortion complications. This woman needed medical care, not equestrian supplies, and she wouldn't have even been able to get the equestrian supplies because it was an answering machine. But about 5.30 a.m., Jennifer's family finally took her to the hospital. Staff were unable to get in touch with Carhartt at the time, eventually he did return their calls. Jennifer was suffering from massive internal bleeding and she coded six times as the staff struggled to stabilize her and she finally died at around 9.30 a.m. 
The medical examiner determined that Jennifer had died from a clotting disorder, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, DIC. That's when the clotting factors in the blood get out of whack. In some forms of DIC, the blood clots too much. In the form that I've been seeing in the abortion patients, the blood just basically turns to water. It, it pours out through every hole it can exit through. It just seeps out through the IVs, the noses will start to bleed. Um, so it was, and the DIC was caused by an amni amniotic fluid embolism, which is fluid from the baby's amniotic sac got into Jennifer's bloodstream. So that caused the cascading series of problems. Um, amniotic fluid embolism and DIC are rare and difficult to predict, but they are also known complications of this sort of abortion, and doctors should be on the alert and ready to deal with them. So could Jennifer have been saved if instead of following Carhartt's instructions to call him first, she had just gone straight to the hospital? Or maybe if Carhartt had answered his freaking phone instead of just letting it ring through to his wife's business? Yeah, it could be the embolism would have killed her anyway, but certainly nothing Carhartt did helped. And again, Perinatal hospice would have at least offered Jennifer and the family some time with little Madison instead of having her killed with an injection straight into her little heart and Jennifer carrying that baby around dead inside her for days on end before she died herself.